In theory, there's more to the universe than just the light we observe. There's an entire high-energy universe filled with astrophysical objects, some large, some small, some very massive, some more modest, some extremely dense, others more diffuse, that can accelerate matter of all types to extraordinarily conditions. They can produce not only high-energy light, such as X-rays and gamma rays, but also particles and antiparticles of all varieties. Protons, nuclei, electrons, positrons, as well as unstable particles that are destined to decay. Many nuclear processes, including fusion and fission reactions, as well as a wide variety of decays, will produce neutrinos and antineutrinos as part of their particle content. This is extremely interesting from an astrophysical perspective, as the very fact that neutrinos have such a tiny interaction cross-section with normal matter means they can largely travel through the universe, even through dense, matter-rich environments, in a practically unstoppable fashion. Other than the fact that the neutrino flux spreads out as we move farther and farther away from the source, the neutrinos and antineutrinos that impact the Earth are very similar to what we'd expect to see if there were no interfering matter along the way at all. The matter that the neutrinos and antineutrinos do pass through, in fact, play only one major role. They can alter what sort of flavor of neutrino one observes in your detector. There are three different types of neutrinos that we can measure, electron, muon, and tau neutrinos. Whenever neutrinos are first made, which specific flavor of neutrino that is required to conserve a specific quantum number, lepton family number, is the one that's produced. However, as neutrinos travel through the universe, they interact with other quanta, both real and virtual. Through those interactions, they can oscillate from one species into another, Therefore, when they arrive at your detector, the flavor of neutrino that arrives may be different from the flavor that was first created. That's why, ideally, you'd build neutrino detectors that are sensitive to all three of the possible flavors, and moreover, can distinguish between them. The original neutrino detectors that we built were sensitive only to the electron flavor of neutrino, the only one we initially knew about. When we began measuring neutrinos from the one nearby source we were certain would be creating them, the Sun, we noticed immediately that we were only detecting about a third of the total neutrinos that we predicted should have been there. This solar neutrino deficit was only resolved decades later, when we combined large data sets from solar neutrino experiments, from reactor and beamline neutrino observations, and from atmospheric neutrino experiments, that is, Experiments that measured the neutrinos that arise from high-energy cosmic rays striking Earth's atmosphere all pointed towards the same conclusion. These neutrinos came in three varieties, were all massive, and whenever a measurement or interaction with another quantum particle took place, must always take on one of those three flavors, electron, muon, and tau. In fact, the only exceptions to those types of neutrinos that we saw, neutrinos created in the Sun, Neutrinos created by a laboratory reaction, like a particle accelerator or a nuclear reactor, and neutrinos created in Earth's atmosphere, arising from cosmic ray showers, came from high-energy astrophysical cataclysms themselves. The first one was seen in 1987, when the light from a supernova arrived from just 165,000 light-years away. In a satellite galaxy of our own, known as the Large Magellanic Cloud, Although there were only about 20 neutrinos arriving across three separate detectors, they were coincident in time, energy, and direction with the neutrinos produced from a core collapse supernova reaction. We quickly realized that neutrino creating reactions were occurring all over the universe and that we could detect them with sufficiently large volumes of material for them to collide with and sufficiently sensitive detectors surrounding them in terms of momentum and energy resolution. That was part of the motivation for building the most sensitive neutrino detector on Earth, Ice Cube. Made up of 86 string detectors that descend into a cubic kilometer of ice at the South Pole, Ice Cube became fully operational more than a decade ago, back in May of 2011. When neutrinos, from any source, strike the glacial ice, they produce secondary particles of all varieties, so long as there's enough energy to create them via E equals mc square. Although all of these particles must travel either at 
if they're massless, or below if they're massive, the speed of light. That restriction applies to the speed of light in a vacuum, in empty space. But because these particles are traveling through ice, not the vacuum of empty space, they can, and often do, travel faster than light in this particular medium, where the speed of light is only about three-fourths of its vacuum value. If a particle gets created moving at more than about 76% of the speed of light in vacuum, it will interact with the ice particles around it, emitting a mix of blue and ultraviolet light in a conical shape, the characteristic signal of Kerenkov radiation. By reconstructing the various Cherenkov radiation signals, we can reconstruct specifically where and at what energies these particles were created with, enabling us to reconstruct the neutrino events that triggered them. Since 2011, when the full detector became operational, certain astrophysical signals that had never been identified via their neutrino signatures before suddenly came into view of IceCube. The most spectacular such signal came from gamma-ray flaring blazers, TXS0506 plus 056. A blazer lies at the heart of an active galaxy, where the galactic nucleus consists of an actively feeding supermassive black hole. Normally, these black holes produce jets of collimated, high-energy radiation that are emitted perpendicular to the accretion disk around the black hole. But in the case of a blazer, that jet points directly at us. All you ever need, if you want to identify a physical source for a signal that you're seeing, is a signal that stands out above the noise background and other backgrounds of your experiment. The fact that we also have a gamma-ray map of the sky, as well as other wavelengths, helped us identify these sources as the origins of these high-energy neutrinos. Even from billions of light-years away, some of these blazers gave off neutrino signatures that stood out spectacularly. But in between the very, very near and the very, very far, there was a tremendous gap. It was hoped by many that IceCube would be sensitive to supernova-produced neutrinos, but the only suspicious signal ever seen was shown to just be a coincidence. IceCube would indeed be capable of spotting neutrinos produced via a core-collapse supernova, but it would have to be very close by, closer than any supernova that's occurred since 2011. However, there were a great number of high-energy neutrino candidate events seen by IceCube, known as alert events, as they offered the possibility of being astrophysical neutrino sources rather than a background event produced in Earth's atmosphere. One strategy has been to attempt to correlate these events with possible high-energy sources in the sky, either known sources of high-energy light, of supermassive black holes, or of high-energy cosmic ray particles, which themselves might correlate with supermassive black holes as well. These observations have placed the tightest constraints to date on the abundance of astrophysical neutrino sources all across the universe. But in a landmark new study, the IceCube collaboration did see something that surprised many. An intermediate source of astrophysical neutrinos, one arising from a relatively nearby galaxy just 47 million light-years away. The galaxy Messier 77 has a number of features that makes it extremely interesting to astronomers. It's a double spiral galaxy with a diffuse outer spiral surrounding the main spiral evidence of a recent gravitational interaction. It has a dusty nuclear region, about 12 light-years across, that emits an intense radio jet and strong emission lines. It's also emitting X-rays from that core, the very central region. In fact, all of these facts indicate activity from the central black hole, making this a galaxy with an active galactic nucleus. In fact, this galaxy was the very first of an entire class of active galaxies known as Seyfert galaxies, as astronomer Carl Seyfert first identified this class with Messier 77 as the archetype. Messier 77 has a supermassive black hole that's about four times as massive as the Milky Way's. It's about 170,000 light-years in diameter, and despite its appearance, it isn't face-on as you might think, but is inclined to our line of sight at about 40 degrees. It recedes from us at 1,100 km per second, caught up in the expansion of the universe. But now there's a new reason to be interested in Messier 77. It's now been identified, thanks to IceCube, as an extragalactic neutrino source. 
It was the most significant location of muon neutrinos observed above both the diffuse background and outside of the other known extragalactic neutrino sources. With 79 excess neutrinos at high energies, more than 1 trillion electron volts, detected over the atmospheric and diffuse astrophysical neutrino background, it can now be claimed that we are, in fact, seeing neutrinos, regularly and over time periods of multiple years, arising from a nearby active galaxy. Moreover, the Ice Cube team, for the very first time, was able to estimate the neutrino flux coming from a Seyfert galaxy such as this, about 16 muon neutrinos per tera electron volt per square meter per year, coming from this source. Most of the neutrinos that arrived were in the energy range of 1.5 to 15 tera electron volt, perhaps indicating the peak of neutrino energy production in this astrophysical environment. If we assume that this galaxy is, in fact, 47 million light years away, and that the other two flavors of neutrinos come in equal quantities. We can use that data to make the first ever estimate of how much energy is emitted from a dusty, active galaxy in the form of neutrinos. Remarkably, the number we get is about 750 million times the energy emitted by the Sun, all in the form of neutrinos all from an active galaxy whose central supermassive black hole only weighs in at about 15 million times the Sun's mass. For comparison, because this active galactic nucleus is also a gamma-ray emitting source, this is 18 times as much energy in the form of neutrinos than is emitted in the form of gamma rays. This may not be evidence of such a severe inherent difference, however. Neutrinos don't interact with the dusty surrounding medium, but gamma rays do, providing a possible reason that the gamma rays might be suppressed. Perhaps even more excitingly, it tells us that we may want to look at another nearby Seyfert-type galaxy that's just 52 million light-years away, as another possible extragalactic neutrino source. It tells us that in the nearby universe, there is at most one active neutrino-emitting active galactic nucleus, similar to Messier 77, in every cubic box, 70 million light-years on a side. And finally, it tells us that there are at least two populations of cosmic neutrino sources, from dusty active galaxies and from blazers, and they have different densities, energies, and luminosities to them. Ice Cube, at long last, is showing us what's out there in the high-energy neutrino universe. Combined with electromagnetic radiation, cosmic ray detectors, and gravitational wave observatories, the multi-messenger universe is finally coming into focus. Thank you so much for coming this far with us. Remember to join us next time, in the next video. Until then, take care 